Hello, Rim the Most High God, and welcome to another edition of the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing. KIB's purpose is to provide an intelligence briefing for the body of Messiah that will both inform and empower the remnant in the last days. We want you to know that you're not alone. There are more of us than you realize. And the ranks of the resistance against Mystery Babylon is growing all over the world. This is episode number 442. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Lake, and I'm in the, and I'm in the KIB studio today with the love of my life, Mary Lou. Hi, everyone. We're sitting in a steamy environment today. I'm glad that there's air conditioning in here, but boy, when you walk out into it this morning, it just kind of slams you in the face, doesn't it? I'm still kind of soaked from taking the puppy for a walk this morning. It didn't, it's so humid and so hot. And I'm just praying that we don't have this through September. This would be just horrible. Oh, we just thank God, though, that he's given us air conditioning. He's keeping everything cool for us, and that's a blessing, let me tell you. A um, couple of weeks ago, we talked to you guys about A.A. A. Allen, and we had a couple of people send us information. Uh, and Mike's got a clip of so interesting of a, a pastor that knew the granddaughter of A.A. A. Allen, and contrary to what is said in the books and everything that you read, um, they said that he was actually killed by a dose of alcohol by a doctor. Yeah. And I'm going to play that. In fact, I, I spent yesterday afternoon researching to see if there were variants of the story. And now there's an, an awful lot of speculation. There's a lot, In fact, I found one, and they uh, withheld the name, so there's no credible way of saying it. And according, according to this individual... He opened up a check, and a $10,000 uh, check fell out, which came from uh, a religious organization made out to the person who sent it. And he said it was this coroner. And according to him, the coroner uh, hung himself because he couldn't live with it. And uh, even went as far as to say that this was such a famous coroner that they made Quincy, uh, you know, the movie Quincy, or the show Quincy mm -hmm. back in the 70s. And, and, I mean, there's a lot of other varying stories. And so, you know, we had uh, several partners reach out to us, and, and I did more research, and I, I found a man named Pastor Joe Sweet uh, from the Shekinah Worship Center down in Lancaster, California, and that he has known the granddaughter of A.A. E. Allen for years. They have been family friends. And so I want to play this clip because, you know, you, you go as close as you can to the original witness to find out what's going on. And so I want to play this for you guys. Just a second. The book I talked about, A.A. A. Allen. In the book, there's a page you need to disregard. It has a copy of his death certificate. And it says in the book that he died of alcoholism. It said, so he lived a great life, but he went off at the end. Well, it's not true. Now, uh, um, A.A. A. Allen's granddaughter is a personal friend of Melinda and mine. And uh, she and her husband pastor a church in Yuba City. And A.A. A. Allen was not an alcoholic. He was murdered by a Christian denomination who, when he went to a doctor's appointment, they paid the doctor to inject him with alcohol, which killed him, and then changed his death certificate to say he died of acute alcoholism. We know the proof because the doctor that signed the death certificate in his 90s confessed to A. A. Allen's family on his deathbed and showed them a copy of the check of $10,000 that he was paid by the Christian denomination to murder A. A. Allen. Now, you won't hear that in public. We heard that from the granddaughter who has a copy of the check. I won't say the name of the denomination. It's from a denominational church. And I think one of the things that's scary is that the the same pharisaical spirit is is alive and well in in different aspects of of the body of Christ today, and you know when sometimes you know even when you look in in historical books and I've you know I've got not only God's generals but four or five other uh, Christian books on the history of, of Pentecostal preachers, Mary every single one of them don't know about this and every single one simply go back to the death certificate. Mm -hmm. And so we just we just wanted to clear the air on this. Yes, and ask forgiveness if, if we passed on um, false information. Yeah, um, but I mean, it's, it's, that's, it's what the, it's what the history was. Well, read. but I mean, we still, I think the old enemy can hold that against us. And uh, we want the truth. And what a horrible thing to happen. Oh, my goodness, isn't that awful? And yeah. I guess the threat that he posed, because, I mean, you can tell, guys, when you when you watch those clips of where he's healing 
those little children and stuff. Oh my goodness, there's such love there, and um, I I absolutely hate it that that was done, but I'm glad that they can they can refute it because that it 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 would I think things like that just kind of um, add to what we're seeing right now with with all of the things coming out about mega pastors and things like that. Uh, I think it'd be real easy for people to just get discouraged and think, is there anything real? Is, and and, and I, there is. And, and there is. And there's, I mean, with uh, the, the one pastor down in Texas that felt they tried to implicate James Robinson in that. And uh, we saw where James and Betty had not only said they had no idea that that was a 12-year-old girl, they actually, at the end of the video, showed proof from the family mm-hmm. that they had no idea. I and didn't believe that because I, I, I just didn't believe that he would have ever... Um, gone for that if he'd known the age. I think he's all along that pastor said it was a young lady. Well, there's a lot of difference between a young lady and a 12 year old. Absolutely. 12 year old's uh, a child. It's a baby, as far as I'm concerned. Me too. So, um, but we wanted to clarify that for you guys, and we appreciate the ones that are, were writing to us. And um, it's, it's just a rough time to watch what's going on. And I mean, this this has been prophesied for a long time this is this is the shaking this is god's i think god's just bringing everything to light so that his his church can get purified well the word says that judgment has to start first in the house of god and i mean and then the apostle goes on to say listen if we scarce get in how much is going to be for those that have rebelled but i i think that for the sake of the remnant and the sake of the body to wake us up we have had too many people that have built kingdoms rather than serving in the kingdom of God. And it has, it has become very problematic, and it has caused a lot of what I call theological drift that uh, I'm looking back at, at, at a lot of things I've been taught all the way back since the 70s. And you see how it extrapolates out historically and it 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 it's, it gets where it's out of control. It, 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 I mean, they've some of, some movements have gone as far as to say that we're little gods, you know, with a little G, and they don't even understand what uh, what's being talked about in the Bible. They don't understand about the divine council, a lot of other things. But whenever if, if the enemy can't get you out of the Word, he'll try to get you off balance in it. I know that the. Um, the reformers talked a lot about the balance that needed to be. And, you know, one of the expressions was testimony and spirit to sancti, and I've talked about that before, but it's a balance of the spirit and the word. And not only that, but then the spirit always testifies of the word. And I think that in the, in the days ahead, one of the things that we're going to have to come back to dead center of what we're supposed to be doing. And, and the purpose of, of the cross, the purpose of the gospel uh, as well as to bring back in balance. We're not, you know, it's almost as if we can command elements. And uh, I was talking with Mike Spaulding there, Dan, I said it's, it's almost as if they have tried to turn us into a Christian version of wizards that can change nations and all this. We change the hearts of people by preaching the gospel, mm-hmm. and then that changes a nation. But um, politics itself, I think, is from the pits of hell. I think it's a Babylonian tactic that has always been used. And sometimes when it, there's also church politics, which is horrific. But we're, we're in a time that everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And it should cause us to press into Jesus more. And the Apostle Paul admonished us, prove everything, test everything. Truth loves scrutiny it loves to be tested lies and half truths will scream how dare you examine that how dare you look at that and so we we need to begin examining everything because I, I, we're, we're entering into a time that only truth the truth of god's kingdom the truth of god's word the truth of god's purpose is the only thing that's going to be unshakable in the days mm-hmm. ahead it will be and there's so much coming out and um, I, I've talked to people that are, are very discouraged. Um, but, you know, God, it's really a, a good indicator because God's purifying so that we can go on and do what he wants us to do in the last days. 
Yes. And I mean, and and in this in this same process, you can look and see God's mercy and and long long suffering for people to have the opportunity to to change. But I think we're getting to the end of that. There's because mm-hmm. of what he has to do in the world mm-hmm. that he's got to judge the church. Yeah. And I just think it's a good time for us to examine ourselves. And at the same time, I was thinking uh, this week and praying, and and uh, I feel like I could give you know some encouragement because when when all this stuff's going on, um, God's God will gently bring things to your mind that you need to correct, repent of, and things like that. But also at the same time, the the old enemy is going to be working to discourage people and think, well, you remember you did this and you did this and and you can't be used by God and things like that. And so, um, God took me to a couple of scriptures. One was Deuteronomy thirty, um, or I'm sorry, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. It says, "For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end." And you know, all through our life we're faced with choices. Um, and I can look back in my life, and I've talked to other people, that that you, you see, oh, boy, there was a, a choice in front of me, and I sure made the wrong one. Yeah, I mean, I've made that over and over so many times in my youth. and um, But I, I can also look back and see, God, okay, he would take that, I made that choice, but then he would rearrange to where down the road he's given me another choice. He makes sure that there's there's opportunities to to veer back to his original path for us. And I I think that's one of the most loving things that God could ever do for us. It's like it's like we do with our kids. If our kids, you know, get off the path, you try to to veer them back. You try to, you know, you to get them back on a path where they'd be safe, back on a path where they're going to be they're prosper in their lives. And so that's such a um, a good thing to think about, and and for God's God's people, we can trust um, how God's established His word in our benefit. That's why I almost read the wrong one. Deuteronomy thirty nineteen says, "I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and thy seed may live." And this was during a time of rebellion, so God was laying it out, reminding them, you know, you can choose. Life where there'll be mm-hmm. blessing, or you, you can. can, and you can make the choices to where you're going to be in a curse. And so, you know, once I think that there's so many people that have been taught opposite of that that if you're a Christian, you can't be cursed. But everybody leaves out, you know, the the covenant and and leaves the out the covenant and, and making the dumb choices. And all of us are guilty of that. Oh man, I, I remember. <laughs> uh, well, this is way back in the 70s. I was uh, at a conference and Bob Mumford was speaking. We always think of when, you know, Peter tried to walk on the water and he almost drowned because he got looking at the waves. We think Jesus reached out and gently grabbed him by the hand and pulled him up. And and Bob Mumford said, you know, there's a real chance that Peter had sore hair that day because he grabbed him up by the hair to save his life. And I wonder how many times that we have... Uh, have ended up with sore hair because at the last minute God in his grace pulled us up. I and there, think there, so many times. There's a dynamic when we read Joshua chapter 1, and, and this is one of the reasons why the church needs to rediscover uh, the commandments of God, and it's not about being culturally Jewish, it's about being biblically correct, is he said, listen, Joshua, if you, if you meditate on my word, you're going to start thinking differently. You're going to start making the choices that I would make. And there's there's this transformation that happens that, you know, sometimes even with generational curses, you can say the prayer. But, and that's step one. Okay, you know, Father, break this curse off of me, especially if it's something that that has been done by actions, Uh okay? But what a lot of people don't teach is it's now doing the word of God to replace that, that you sometimes you have to walk yourself out of your bondage. You've got to, uh, the children of Israel still had, even though they were set free, they still had to walk out of Egypt. Even though when God said it was time for them to leave Babylon, they had to choose to walk mm-hmm. out. And it's, it's in that walking and doing the things that God begins reversing the curse. Because everything that we think, we say, or we do is very binary. It either opens doors or closes doors. 
when I get in the flesh and I do what the enemy wants me to do, I'm closing a door to God and I'm opening a door to the devil. And I, I think the transition from curse to blessing is in the same proportion that you have more doors open to God than you do to the enemy. And of course, a mature believer, uh, it should be a rare thing that the enemy has an open door in their life, that, they, that they're, they're very um, attentive, that if, if they do sin, they're quick to repent mm-hmm. and they're, they're quick to go back to the word and, and quick to hear the Holy Spirit as he's trying to convict us or, or get us on the, on the right path. And that, that's a part of Christian maturity. But, you know, we, we've had in our theologies, uh, especially of the faith movement, they, they, they were teaching you how to beat up on the devil. At the same time, they told you that the devil couldn't touch you, which goes completely contrary to what the Apostle Peter said, that he goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. He wrote that, you know, several decades after the cross. And so did Peter get the memo? I think he did. And he said, listen, if the devil can find a way in, especially the more that you're used by God, and this is what uh, those of us that are called to ministry need to realize, the more God uses us, the more vigilant that we have to become because the enemy will try to take, if we're actually being effective in the kingdom, he wants to shut us up. He wants to take us down. There's no such thing as too big to fail in the kingdom. I I think that... um, if we grow larger in the kingdom through humility rather than the hubris that the world and Babylon tries to pump into us, the more quickly we are that we realize our absolute dependence upon him and, and having to walk in the kingdom. And we're really on guard because we realize that if our ministry is going to get messed up, we're the ones that's going to do it. Mm-hmm. And I, I think we have forgotten that truth. I think this thing where the devil can't touch us, you can't be cursed, you can't be this, you can't be that. Well, then why are so many ministries falling like dominoes? They can. That's when we have forgotten that we're on guard. We're guarding against a hungry lion looking for a place, looking for an avenue. He's constantly, uh, you know, whenever you're in the military and you set up a perimeter around your base, the enemy will constantly be testing that perimeter to try and find a weak spot. Mm -hmm. And so if if you do discover a weak spot, what do you do? You reinforce it. You reinforce the weak spots, and you make sure that all of that is maintained. And you know how long do we need to do that until we're standing before the throne of Jesus? As mm-hmm. long as we're standing on this in this world, we have got to be on guard because we're on duty twenty four seven. Mary, well, I think that I think once you get you know all of the hidden things taken care of, then it's a progression. But so many people, Mike, Catholics don't understand what they've been taught. No, and and the the vulnerable position they're in. Uh, Freemasons don't understand what they've done is wrong. You know, if, if they don't have if they don't have a teaching that would tell them them something's wrong, they're just they're just open season for the enemy. And I think that he'll you know, it's like I said, I think he has this little ticket book and, and yeah. he he says, I've got this ticket. If you ever cause me trouble, then I'm gonna cause you trouble. And um and, you know, in a situation like that, you, you could have just um, one attack after another and, and be trying your very best to not have any sin that you know of. Yeah. And that's, that's what is concerning to me is because I think we've all been put in positions in the last decades to where it's, it would be hard to find a family that wasn't operating in, in some form of that. Absolutely. I think, I think I had a friend, Dr. Wilf Kent, and one of his major teachings was you have to lay an ax to the family tree mm-hmm. and because you're now grafted into Jesus and begin drawing from that. Quit drawing yeah, from, from, from the old man, start drawing from the new. And that, that is the something, nothing in, 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 the, in our walk with God happens automatically. We're, we're laboring in the field. You've got to choose to accept Jesus. Mm-hmm. You, you've got to choose to grow in him. You've got to choose to put in the work to get into the word and to change your life. And to and if you have a problem area, get into the word and begin meditating on that word in that area, what God says should be going on. Mm-hmm. And, you know, for some it's family. For some it's, you know, the Bible literally tells us that we, that we have to uh, bring our vessel into control. 
whether it's, you know, sexually or, or, or with greed or money or whatever, whatever the area is, that we're required by God to, that's why the Apostle Paul said, he said, listen, I buffet my body daily. I, I bring myself into subjection to the cross. I bring myself into subjection to the ways of God purposely. Because only through Jesus, Mary, do we ever have the power to do it. Willpower isn't enough. But when I, when I choose to do the word to honor God, all of a sudden the Holy Spirit can say, I can work with that. It's, it's not you thinking you're somebody all by yourself, but you're realizing that you need me and you need that word. And I'm going to put the hammer and the nail in your hand and I'm going to help you crucify that so there can be a resurrection in that area of Christ likeness. Yeah, if you, if you can break past any false teaching that you have, um, because a lot of, of the thoughts in my head, once I was free enough and I could read the word, then all of a sudden I was seeing inconsistencies with what I'd been taught all those years. Uh, and the same thing would be like for Mormonism or, or you know, like some, some things that, you know, that people disagree on, I don't think is, is big, you know, like the pre-trib, post, all that. But, boy, there are some things, Mike, that could get you in big, big trouble, especially like in the charismatic movement with the infiltration of New Age and witchcraft and things like that. And, and I think that there are, you know, this is what I've observed and experienced. Um, witchcraft has built immense power mm-hmm. because, the, you know, one of the, the key principalities over America is Jezebel. And so... So there, there's been a whole system established to funnel the power to Jezebel. And so there's so many things that we deal with in our lives that are connected to that, that if you, if you weren't aware of it, you wouldn't even, even think about something being witchcraft. But the power is so great that I think that, you know, I, I don't get discouraged because I know that God is so much greater. I just get concerned that somebody will get sucked down a vortex so far that they can't, they can't get out. Because now at the same time, Satan has done all of this. He's established this horrible system to get you in bondage, keep you in bondage. He's going to beat people over the head, uh, making them think that they, they can't do anything. He's going to remind you of your past that you've already, get, you know, already asked God to forgive you for. Um, you know, the problem with this, this latest scandal with Reverend Morris is this isn't an this isn't a run of the mill moral failure. This involved a child and that puts a whole different set of dynamics in there. You know, for other people you, you say, Well, people stumble and, and we need to, to pray for their families. We need to pray for in, people in churches that have, you know, left the faith because of, of a leader. Um, but, but the, you know, 1 Corinthians 2, 9 says, But as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. If you love God, he has a plan to get you out of any mess that the enemies put you in. And see, that's, that's the big thing is getting into the plan, which is really mm-hmm. what we're not taught. Um, the Bible tells us not to turn to the right hand or to the left hand. Uh, one of the things that then I'm going to, can I do a little mini teaching before I do my teaching? Oh, for, I'm done with, with my part other than just commenting on yours. You know, with, with God's omnipresence, God fills all space time. And so God fills all time the same way he does space to where all your tomorrows, he's already there. And there is a path for you. And in fact, the rabbis teach in the six days of creation that God not only created the heavens and the earth, but he created every, the answer to every prayer that's ever been prayed. And uh, we've had uh, a good number of people that have been to heaven that have literally seen, if you will, warehouses of prayers to be delivered. And, and as I was, I was praying about this and meditating about it, God said, listen, there's, there's a temporal path that you're supposed to walk on, that if you're obedient to me, you walk right into that answer to prayer because you're not turning to the right, you're not turning to the left, you're not letting the enemy get off. But have any of us ever been in a situation that's like we feel more like the, the, the wandering Hebrews in the wilderness that simply go around in circles? You see, God, God is immovable, okay? And so if, if I go and, and there was this 
test that I was supposed to pass, and I failed it. On the other side of that test is my blessing or my answer. God's only option is to put me into a circle and bring me all the way back around till I go into that thing again. See how you handle it now. <laughs> and see how you handle it now. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, and this time be faithful. Yeah, I went in those circles. And because, <laughs> because a lot of believers aren't taught that, we, do, we just go round and round mm-hmm. and round in circles, and we say, you know, I've been doing this thing for 20 years, and I'm in the exact same spot that I was 20 years ago. It's because you, you've never been taught, okay, God in his grace is going to bring you back because there was something you were supposed to learn, there was something that you were supposed to bring in obedience to him that you didn't, that is necessary for the journey. Once you, you know, it, it's, it's like, the I think that literally the very spot that Israel refused to cross the Jordan, and God says, okay, you're going to wander in the wilderness 40 years. I, I think after that, the next generation, I think God brought them back to the exact same spot and says, you're going to cross now. And then he parted the waters. There, there, there's something about God that we, we need to understand that, what, wait, no, what, is the, what is the real purpose of our walk with God? The modern church would tell us it's so that we can be happy. You know, best life now. Well, my best life is going to be in heaven. It's not going to be now because I'm, I'm in a state of war right now. Uh, what's going to be so that we're rich? And we, we have taken the message that God is actually concerned about meeting our daily needs, and we've turned it into God. We've turned it into a Laodicean message that it's all about money. Uh, I want to read uh, from you guys, and this is in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 31. And we, a lot of times people will take snippets of this, and when you take it out of context, whenever I look at a section of, of verses, I look for the punchline. I look for the, the thing that's the goal to make it all make sense. He says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do, uh, for we do not know what we should pray as for as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the heart knows the mind of the, what, the, what the mind of the Spirit is because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that all things work together for good for those who love God to those who are called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also, pre, he also predestined, and here's the punchline, to be conformed into the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn of many brethren. In other words, his brethren... And sisters, okay, the family should look just like him. You know, have you ever seen a like a large family, and it's very obviously they're all related. They act the same. They look the same. See, Jesus is the standard. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called, and whom he called, these he also justified, and whom he justified, these he also glorified. Then what shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? I've heard people take, okay, now the Spirit's making intercession for us. Okay, about what? They they take that by itself. He's making intercession for us that we would be conformed into the Mm -hmm. image of Christ. How can God work all things together for good? He can even take the stupid mistakes that I've made and bring me back to a place of repentance Mm -hmm. so that I learn from that, so that area of my life can be crucified, so that the resurrection life instills the image of Christ in me. Or we also have, we also, sometimes bad things happen even when you're obedient. Why, Joseph was thrown into prison by his own brothers. He was thrown into slavery, thrown into prison. He said, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good because now I'm in a place where I can save my family. And we, we see the same thing with Daniel. Daniel ended up in captivity, ended up all the things that he did in Babylon. We, we, we see this over and over again, but it's those that love God and who are called. It's not just anyone who professes to be a Christian, because I think there are a lot of Christians that may be in love with the movement, may be in love with the feeling that church gives them, but they're not in love with Jesus. They may be in love with their Hebrew roots, but they have lost Jesus. You see, what, what, what's the purpose of the commandments? To help me be conformed into the image of Christ. Right. All of this is about developing Christ's likeness in my life, developing the fruit of the Spirit. And I think in, in sometimes in Pentecostal and charismatic circles, we put such an emphasis on the gifts of the Spirit, 
Now there's nine gifts, but there's also nine fruit because they balance each other out. It's kind of like, and I, and I refer to this, I think it was in the, the book, The Priest of the Believer, that they operate to bring harmony with one another to give the bells a true sound. Because the Apostle Paul said, listen, if you can do all these miracles you have not loved, you're just, you're just clanking, okay? That we have had so much emphasis on signs and wonders that if you don't have Christ's likeness, it begins getting you off. You can, you can believe God for finances, but if you don't have Christ's likeness, it'll get you to where you're Laodicean. That without, without the Christ likeness permeated in our theology, we're going to get off, Mary. Because I'm not predestined. I'm going to say if I said, I'm not predestined to be a millionaire. I'm not predestined to be happy every minute of my life. I'm not predestined to have this huge ministry and all these things. I'm given a portion of the ministry of Jesus according to the apostles in Acts chapter 1. Each one of us in ministry, we get to be a small part of what he is doing in the earth. But I am predestined to reflect his glory. I am predestined to be conformed into his image. And when we return to the very basics of that, I think it's going to bring balance again to the body. Because it's only where his image has been forged, sometimes in the heat of battle, by the Holy Spirit. Those things cannot be shaken. It's going to be those things that stand up against the son of perdition. Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. There will be those that know their God and they will do great exploits. That, that know there is intimacy. In fact, it's the same word that is used on, on intimacy like in, in marriage. It's, it's the same word that they're going to be so close to God that even though the son of perdition is at his zenith, he's not going to affect them. They're going to be a pain in his side. Yeah. And in fact, there's parody because it says that he's doing great exploits, and it's the same. It's the same words in the original language. So there, there becomes parody that although although the uh, the false prophet and the antichrist is moving in all these great signs and wonders, it's going to be countered by great signs and wonders by those that really know their God that have had the image of Christ formed in them, mm-hmm. and won't be subject to fear, because if you if you get that grounding in the word of god i mean we've we're living proof that you can go through unbelievable bizarre activity and keep a sound mind oh yeah Uh, only with jesus i've looked back and i've thought there is only one way i have a sound mind at this point and that is is jesus i mean totally to his glory because that you know there's just so and and i think that more and more people are going to have that you know part of probably what we're going through right now is is god forging that stability in us through him because i think we're going to see more and more disturbing things i think we're going to be faced with challenges and i think that we'll all learn our dependency on him you know and and i I think of peter remember when peter was set free from jail the angel showed up and got them out peter was supposed to die the next day that's that's what Herod had, I'm, I'm going to kill him. It was very popular. We killed, we killed the other one. Now we're going to go after Peter. This is getting really popular. Let's go ahead and kill a bunch of apostles. Jesus had already told him that he was going to be an old man that's going to be, have to be helped around. He already had a word. Here he is relatively young. They say you're going to not die the next day. Mary, the angel, had to wake him up on the night before he was going to be executed. Pretty peaceful, I guess. <laughs> Pretty peaceful. I always look at that uh, and I thought, dude, I'd have been, I'd have been dead. <laughs> My eyes would have been this big all night long. Didn't sleep a wink. It's like I got the caffeine. But the angel had to wake him up. Say, okay, let's go, because he already had a word from Jesus. And we don't realize that when Christ, Christ the image of Christ is formed in us, it comes with a lot of promises of God. It comes with uh, a lot of God saying, listen, I'm, I'm getting ready to bring you deeper into my covenant. And when we have that, we can face absolute uncertainty. Mm-hmm. And it's like, okay, I've already been through some things. I have seen God has brought me through some things. Years ago, I was studying about the life of David. And I'm thinking, you know, here he is, and just a young kid is you know, probably in his teens, 
late teens, and he faces Goliath, and the kid's fearless. And I'm thinking, how in the world do you get there? And God said he was a shepherd. He killed coyotes. Then he killed a lion and a bear. I let, and now God could have kept all those things away from David and his flock. But every one of those challenges prepared him for Goliath. That when he got there, he looked at this giant that had all the armies of Israel hiding in holes. And he said, who does this uncircumcised Philistine think that he is that he can mock the armies of the living God? You just don't arrive there instantaneously. God had him on a track when he was when he was a shepherd preparing him. Out by yourself with nothing but a sling and a staff. You know, it's like, you know, if I if I met a bear in the woods, I'd want a ten millimeter or, <laughs> or an AR fifteen. I would not want a sling. And the kid was so accurate that without fear he took down a lion, he took down a bear. And God progressively got him there. So when it came time for Goliath, he was ready. When I'm in the will of God, when each one of us, and God is developing this Christ-likeness in us, and I'm in the will of God, I am going to have Goliaths. I am going to have giants that I've got to take down. But God makes sure that I meet them in his timing when I'm prepared. What the devil wants to do is to get you out of the timing of God and, and to get you off the path that you're supposed to walk so that you meet them out of the sequence that you're supposed to meet them in. When you haven't taken down a coyote, it's not time to think you can take down a giant. God in his grace, he has this path of preparation for you. But when we get into sin or our theology's off and all these different things, Satan takes us out of sequence so that we're not prepared. The devil doesn't play fair. He doesn't want you prepared for what's ahead. God does. That's why the Holy Spirit's always making intercession for you. Mm-hmm. Well, and isn't it um, comforting to know that what choices you have made that have been bad and, and missing marks and, and stumbling and stuff, God can still use that in this preparation for strength building. I mean, yeah, if you look learn at, from it, you know, somebody might be listening to us and think, well, you don't know the road I've been down. I, I got on drugs. I was over here. I was doing this, but, but God c- could have taken that at that time. He pulled you through it. Didn't he? You did. I mean, so you, no matter what you've walked through, if you're still alive this day, then you've got strength that's been forged in you through what you've walked through. He tur- God always turns trials into testimonies because there's someone else in the same situation. that we, When they can see Christ in us, they see hope. Mm-hmm. And when they see hope, you see that it, it's, it's, it's not a magic formula of confessing or whatever. It's saying, listen, I repented, I did the work, and God did his work. And because it was based upon the word of God, if anybody does this, it will work for them if God's in the mix. Mm-hmm. So that any testimony is repeatable. That's the power of testimony. Right. And so God brought us through. He brought us out. All of us have come out of a prison. For some of us, it may be the prison of drugs. For some of us, it may have been drug addiction or sex addiction or money addiction or whatever. Every one of us had a prison that God brought us out of. And that trial became a testimony that when we get strong, we become a beacon for those that are still in darkness so that they can come out. That's right. A lot of times you need to see someone walk out of what you've been through. Oh, yeah. You know, you may be convinced that it's impossible, but all things are possible with God, and, and I've seen that. You know, the, the guy that, uh, that wrote Amazing Grace was a slave trader. And you know, if they and back when they were trying to make it illegal, they would have them all chained together. A lot of them, they just simply drowned them. They 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 were all chained together, and they would cast this stone over, and just drag all the slaves off the ship and drown them at sea. I mean, there were a whole bunch of horrible things. When he wrote, he saved a wretch like me. We don't know the depth 
of what he did. He, in fact, he he dedicated the rest of his life as a man of God. He he left slave trading and and all then all that business, and I kind of wonder because you know I, I look at some of the things in his life and and how that he was even trying to help stop slavery in uh, in Great Britain. I think he was a man driven. I think the Apostle Paul was a man driven. Because, you know, we always speculate what was the thing that drove the Apostle Paul? What was the thorn in the flesh? And I think the thorn in his flesh was his past. That because of him, believers that he's now trying to make believers, families were destroyed, that people lost their lives. And I wonder how many times at night, as he would pray, he would still see faces. That, that to me gives the answer, while like in Iconium, they, they stoned him to death, left him for dead, and you know believers gathered around him, and the next day he's preaching back in the same city. He was a man driven. He had a prophet show up and said, listen, if you go to Jerusalem, you're going to be bound, and you're going to be, going to, and, 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 you're going to be bound and, and heading to Rome. God warned him. He was a man driven. I know. Hush up, prophet. I'm going to do it. But yet... In one of his epistles, and I always wondered, you know, why, why was he so um, driven to get to Rome? And then in one of his epistles, it's just a, a little greedy, just a little line. And he said, oh, by the way, those of the household of Caesar greet you. He had led members in Caesar's household to the Lord. He was a man driven. We can let the past either hold us back or drive us deeper into the kingdom. Well, that's good preaching. That's true. He was a man driven. He was a man that was so driven. And, you know, Second Timothy is the last epistle that he ever wrote. Tradition tells us that when it came time for him to give his life, he ran to the executioner because he's done. That he, t- he first admonished Timothy, he said, listen, I'm getting ready to die. I want you to preach the word in season, not a season. I want you not to hold back one bit. But he also made this thing. He said, listen, I've finished the race. I've run the race. I've finished the fight. That he did not have one single thing left on his to-do list from Jesus. Or maybe even his own internal list that he had made himself. Of what he wanted to get done for this Jesus that he met on the road to Damascus that's changed his life forever. And one of my prayers has been, God, if I can do anything, I want to be like the Apostle Paul. That when it comes time, if you tarry, and it comes time for me to close my eyes in death, I don't want to have things in the back of my mind I shoulda, coulda, woulda. I want to be able to rest knowing everything that God has called me to do, every book, every sermon, every whatever I was supposed to do, that I got it done, that I can stand before my king and say, look what you did because I got out of the way and let you do it because Christ was formed in me. And you know, at this point in time, you have to know this, that um, God chose us to live during this time. So he's put within the people, what they need to do what he's called them to do. There's a kingdom tenacity on the inside of you that can only be released released to the same proportion that the image of Christ is released in you. The more you become like Jesus, the harder target you become for the kingdom of darkness. And, And what I'm seeing is people looking in the mirror and saying, I could never I can never even try to get there. And that's a lie. It is. The enemy's lying to you. He's he's trying you know, anytime the old enemy does that and he brings things up to you over and over again, and especially if you've repented of things and said, Oh God, I'm sorry, uh, forgive me for uh, harm I've done and when you truly repent before God, then that that's something that's settled between you and God. The enemy's gonna try to remind you of it. He's gonna try to stop you. But what God's trying trying to do is is saying, see yourself like <clears throat> I see you. Yeah. See yourself on what I've put inside of you and what you can become. Don't hit, let him remind you of something that's in the past. 
Yeah. And, you know, the, the truth is, imagine the Apostle Paul. Okay, now he's writing to former pagans. He's not writing to people raised in the Jewish community doing good. But those that were Gentiles, they were pagans. They were having orgies down in their temples and, and, and all these different things as they worshiped these false gods. And, and when you look at the, the Roman culture, I mean, it was um, pretty rank, okay? The Apostle Paul being raised Jewish his entire life with the commandments, he told them, I'm the chiefest of all sinners. So it doesn't matter where we started. What matters is where we end. And either Christ can save to the uttermost, or he can't save at all. And we know he can save. But we have got to let him redeem us from the past and quit looking back at Egypt and press on to the promised land that he's called us to. And, you know, there's a lot of tricks that the uh, Babylon will do. And I'm, in fact, I'm writing an article right now called The Bewitchment of Babylon. And the Apostle Paul, to those in, in Galatia, he said, who has bewitched you? Which literally means to cast a spell. If it, also, it also means to give an evil eye that you're looking at something enviously. And there were those of the Shammai rabbis that were teaching salvation through circumcision, not through faith in Christ. And he said, who bewitched you? And I think bewitchment is a real way the enemy uses to get the body off because right oh, now there has time. been there has been a lot of bewitchment in the body of Christ, whether it was for finances or all the crazy stuff that's going on, uh, even teaching the authority of the believer out of balance. There is a bewitchment going on. When you think that you're becoming a god, little g, there's bewitchment going on, Okay. If you think you're too big to fail, there's bewitchment going on. If you think that we're going to take over this planet and then get everything under control and create our own millennial reign and then hand it to Jesus, there's bewitchment going on, okay? And the Apostle Paul, and this, I like this out of the Amplified Bible. It's in Galatians 4.19. He said, My little children from whom I am again in the pains of labor until Christ is completely and permanently formed within you. That he said, listen, you've, you've left the image of Christ. You've left what Jesus is supposed to be doing in your life for another gospel. And he went into prayer. He said, listen, I'm, I'm travailing as a woman in labor in, in my intercession for you guys. And, and I, think that's, I think we need to enter into a season of intercession for the remnant that Christ would be completely and permanently formed back within the remnant. Well, that's it. And I, I was reminded, you know, I mentioned mirrors while ago, and, and there's a lot that witches can do with mirrors. And so I'm just going to pray over that right now. Father, any uh, mirror that is being used by any witches, any covens, any people in the occult, I plead the blood of Jesus into those things and ask forgiveness for any sins that allowed bewitchment to be involved in mirrors in people's homes, uh, mirrors that people are looking in, and I break that by the blood of the Lamb, and I command any spirit that's attached to those that has hindered people, that has bewitched people, that has done all of these things, I break your power and command you to leave those people in the name of Jesus. You leave any mirror that they've ever looked in in the name of Jesus. And I, I think in, in uh, 1 Corinthians 12, 1 through 5, Paul brings the balance that we need to see. Uh, and there's, there's several outstanding things in this, and I want to read it, then comment on it if I can. He said, My brother, when I came to you, uh, did not come with excellency of speech or of wisdom declaring to you the testimony of God. And let me tell you, tell you something. As a trained rabbi, he could have put anybody on their table. He was trained by Gamaliel, okay? He could have been a great orator, but he chose to come with simplicity. He said, for I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. You guys need to underline that in your Bible. When we go into a fellowship, if you can't see Jesus and him crucified, leave. That is, that, is the, that is the standard, to see Christ and him crucified. But then he goes on, he says, 
For I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and power, that your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. How did the Apostle Paul... This, I, I want true signs and wonders. True signs and wonders is you don't come in the ways of the world. You don't come in the ways of the New Age. Quit quoting morals and dogma and, and Kabbalah. Quit quoting all these things that, are, that, are, that make you sound wise and that's just all mystical and all this stuff. Let's go back to the simplicity of God's Word. Yes. Knowing that unless the Spirit of God confirms the Word with signs and wonders, we can't do squat. In fact, I remember listening years ago to an uh, evangelist that was known for signs and wonders. And he said, every once in a while, he says, I'll do a meeting. And he says, I'll fall flat on my face. And he says, I'll tell you exactly why. He said, all of a sudden, I started listening to my own public relations. I started listening. I started thinking I was somebody. And he said, I made a deal with Jesus a long time ago. I'm nobody, and you're everything. And he said, God would let me fall flat on my face to just remind me. I can't do a thing without him. But you know, Mary, in the modern church, even in some of these ones that uh, you know, we, we have caught healing evangelists using mass hypnosis and a lot of different things, Jesus could not even, wouldn't even have to be in the building and you wouldn't know it wouldn't affect the service. Because the songs you just write, everything is psychological, it's manipulated, and, and all these different things. We need to be so dependent upon God that if the Spirit of God isn't, isn't in the building, we're grieved. Mm -hmm. That if Jesus isn't crucified, we're grieved. If, if, we, if, if Jesus isn't there, we don't want to be there. I don't care how good the music is. I don't care how spectacular and profound the oration is. We don't want to be there. Because we've replaced a lot of things for the simplicity of the gospel. And, and you know, I, I, have, I have been at meetings that um, profound depths was there, but God wasn't. Well, you said Jesus and him crucified. Um, if you don't get that, yeah. if you don't get the suffering that he went through and his heart, his love, you aren't getting the right foundation. That's right. And see, with the Apostle Paul... Romans chapter 12, you know, and then uh, he said, listen, guys, he said, because of what Jesus has done, I beg you. King James says, I beseech, that means beg. I beg you to offer up your bodies as a living sacrifice, which is the least you can do. And the modern church says, man, you're getting radical to have to live every day for Jesus and to buffet the flesh and to, and to crucify the flesh every day. And, and you're just getting radical. The Apostle Paul said, listen, in light of the cross, that's kindergarten. That's the least that you can do. Now, how to go further than that is to renew your mind to the Word of God so that you can prove what the will of God is. There, there are, because our, our theologies have been so watered down, and, and we haven't maintained this balance of the Spirit and the Word, that what would be considered normal Christianity in the first century would be considered absolutely radical by most of the church today. Well, don't you think the shaking's going to get us there, though? It's going to take us back, and, and we've, got to, um, we've got to go forward based on the truth of the of the foundation of God's word. Oh, absolutely. And th this is a time, if, if I don't want to be shaken in my life, I've got to examine everything to make sure that I'm on the solid rock that Jesus said the church was going to be established on, mm -hmm. and that is the revelation that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. No other way. And what faith in that means. Once I get there, that's why in the book of Hebrews it says, see to it that you're a part of a kingdom that can't be shaken. 
it's not the shaking that's coming is not about destroying you. It's about revealing everything that's not of the kingdom of God. Mm-hmm. And if I and if I'm living a crucified life and Jesus image is established in me, he can shake the universe and I'll remain unshaken. Yeah, that's true. And so, guys, it's time for us to up to standards. It's time for us to go deeper because the modern church has been handing us cotton candy, telling us it was meat. Yeah, and God's showing us through the shaking that we've got to go deeper. Yeah. And so, guys, I just ask that the Holy Spirit would just give you an anointing for examination. And uh, in the in the weeks and the months to come, we're going to be getting into a lot of things, both in the Kingdom Intelligence Briefing and Biblical Life TV and, and books that uh, I made share things you don't really want to hear. But, you know, I, I was taught as a, as a young Baptist minister that if you couldn't step on toes, you weren't doing your job because they, they, there's, there's things that we need to challenge. And if it holds up to scrutiny, test everything. Mm-hmm. It may even be your favorite doctrine. Well, my favorite doctrine is Christ and him crucified. That's my favorite doctrine. Everything else has to flow from that. And if it tries to contradict that, and end of God. And, and to get back into kingdom, kingdom, not churchianity, not denominationalism, but kingdom, where Jesus is ruling and reigning, to where we live for the king, if need be, we die for the king, but we're in his hands. That's how you see the book of Acts beginning to flow in our day, Mary. And I, I think that the book of Acts, we're going to see the book of Acts and the book of Judges come together. Mm-hmm. Because right now, in a lot of portions of the body of Christ, because there was no king, men did what was right in their own eyes. The king is getting ready to manifest himself. And he's going to take down a lot of enemies. He's also going to reveal false foundations. He's going to reveal a lot of things for the sake of his people, for yeah. the sake of his great name. Well, the the good news is is we're seeing the, the shaking in the church. We're seeing... Um, Judgments beginning at God's house. The The good news of that is we're going to make it through this, and we're going to see judgment on the wicked, and we're going to see injustice dealt with. Yes. And if we deal with our stuff, then God can start concentrating yeah. on the world. And I, I want to see the last great revival. I want to see, and, you know, even with, uh, I've, I've heard from Carl and Gallops and Zev Parat, there is more interest in Messiah in Israel now since this war began mm-hmm. than has ever existed. Those that used to resist the gospel are now asking Zev, tell me about oh, who Jesus that is. That's wonderful. And so God is working. Yes, he is. Our job is to get in the flow of the kingdom and out of the mire of Babylon. And Father, give us your grace and your power to do it. In Jesus' name. Stay informed. Tune in to weekly podcasts by Dr. Michael and Mary Lou Lake to keep you informed, inspired, and empowered in the kingdom of God. Tune in to www.kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. That's kingdomintelligencebriefing.com. This video was made possible by our partners worldwide. Please prayerfully consider supporting the ministry that is preparing the remnant for the unfolding of end times prophecy. Send your offerings to Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri. That's Biblical Life, P.O. Box 160, Seymour, Missouri, 65746-0160. You can also donate online at store.biblical-life.com. That's store.biblical-life.com.